production for Panther Sports Talk is brought to you in part by the following supporters of WEIU. Welcome to another edition of Panther Sports Talk right here on WIU. I'm your host, Rich Moser. We're joined each week by head football coach Kim Dameron. And coach, I guess first of all, congratulations. I know <laughs> you, got, you got the first win there, and more importantly, the first win came in conference play, which is always, at the end of the day, is you want to win every game, but you need to win as many conference games as possible to be able to guarantee a spot in postseason. That, that, <laughs> that's exactly right. And we know um, <clears throat> going in that, um, you know, we, we talked about it, you know, being – uh, our first OVC game. And so we're excited about being 1-0 in the OVC right now. Now, 13 straight wins. You guys are tied with North Dakota State. A couple weeks before you play Eastern Kentucky, which will be your next game, I guess the hardest task for you now has got to be able to get the guys focused on a non-conference game against Ohio mm -hmm. since, unlike a normal schedule, you're not rolling right into another conference game. Yeah, it, it's it's something that's it's a little difficult, but it is what it is. Um, you know, and we've talked all year long, all the way dating back to the Minnesota game about, the, you know, we're playing faceless opponents. It's just, this is opponent number one, opponent number two. And we've tried to keep that theme kind of going all year long. And so, you know, this is uh, now uh, opponent number five, and we've got to go play uh, a good football team on the road. And so, uh, you know, we need to have a great week of preparation. Now, you guys are coming off a week of highs, and you kind of, I think, got the offense that you kind of expected all along to kind of seem like it hit on all cylinders. I think all along you guys wanted to be able to run the ball effectively. Part of that was probably the fact that you kind of settled on a quarterback and, and Jalen Whitlow came out and kind of showed some of the things that you guys had seen on tape at Kentucky that made you want to get him here. Well, he, he, um, <clears throat> he gives us the ability to, to uh, run the football, but I will say this, as you saw in the second half, when Andrew came in and played, he did run the quarterback run game effectively. Uh, I think we still have two good football players there. Yes, we did uh, kind of settle in with, <clears throat> excuse me, with Jalen and going forward, you know, I feel like that uh, right now he gives us uh, that ability to make the, the home run uh, play, the big play, uh, the explosive play down the field at the quarterback position. And, um, and so, you know, it's still going to take everybody on this football team and both quarterbacks to win this league. And that's what our focus is, is making sure that we have enough weapons to be able to go through a conference schedule uh, and, and, win the, and win the OVC. Now you guys set two or tied one record, broke another record in rushing the other day. Jalen Whitlow sets the record for rushing yards by a quarterback, which is kind of an obscure record. And part of it is that offenses have changed over the course of time. So I guess to break that record in this modern age where everybody throws it all over the field, it has got to be somewhat of an accomplishment. Well, you know, I, I was here in 2000, and I, I know what Coach Spoo's philosophy yeah. was as far as quarterbacks. It wasn't to run them. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that from experience. Uh, and he had, you know, great quarterbacks here and, and great success here and all that. Um, but uh, I, being a defensive coach, uh, one of the things that I've always hated is having to defend all 11 guys. And you see it now in the NFL. You see it, you know, all across the country. The people that are putting up the big numbers, for the most part, offensively, are the people that can uh, run the ball effectively at, at not only the running back position, but the quarterback position. And uh, it makes defenses really uh, get honest in a hurry. And then that opens up your pass game. But... Um, you know, it's something that, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely by design, and, and it's something that I've always felt like, uh, you know, we had the ability to do. Uh, probably, you know, looking back in the first three games, may have been, do, should have been doing it a little bit more, but, hey, you know, we can't go backwards. We have to look forward. And so we have to make sure that we're getting uh, the right people in the right places right now. Now, the other thing you did is you tied the school record for rushing yards, 413. And an interesting part of that is, in addition to the fact that it was balanced across the board, you did it without one of your best offensive weapons even in the game. Uh, yeah, yeah, we would have loved to have had Shep uh, there on Saturday. But, um, uh, you know, Taylor Duncan obviously is a very capable runner. And I think we saw that Jimmy Lara and uh, A.J. Woodson are capable runners. And then, you know, Malik Harrison comes in and on third and 21 goes and jumps in the yeah. end zone. So, um yeah, I was very pleased about the way our running backs played and the way they carried the ball. The thing I was the most pleased with is that we did all that with no turnovers. Yep. 
And I know that's been one of the things that you guys have kind of hurt you the last couple games. On the defensive side of the ball, the one thing I guess as a defensive coordinator you're, you have to be happy about is that you were able to get some young guys some experience. The, the game kind of was in hand midway through the third quarter, and that allowed you guys to get some young guys who help you a lot in practice to get out there and get real game reps. Uh, especially at linebacker. Uh, you know, we got uh, Brandon Ross in the game. Uh, you know, um, uh, Seth McDonald played quite a bit, um, you know, which was something that was big. Our, our backup defensive lineman got to play quite a bit. Thomas Coronado played uh, really basically the whole second half. Uh, and so uh, we did. Uh, we, we rolled some guys in the back end. We've got, I think we played maybe five safeties and five corners. And so it does. That, that, those kind of games, obviously, when you, when you get those kinds of games, you want to take advantage of that and be able to get some guys some game experience. And that was another benefit of, of being able to uh, uh, control the ball offensively was that defensively we – that and our defense was playing pretty darn good. Uh, and even the, when the twos got in, I thought they executed fairly well. Now, I hear coaches say this all the time, the 24-hour rule. A lot of times it applies more to you've lost a game and you come back. I heard you kind of – kind of putting that out there to the players after they beat Austin P that hey guys come back on Sunday celebrate the win tonight mm -hmm. we got to get back to work it's got to be a little easier when they're coming off the 24-hour rule on a win than a, than a loss in fact oh, and how to get is. the message across <laughs> it, it definitely is uh, but um, <clears throat> you know it's something like I said each week we've tried to not approach things any differently uh, whether it be from an emotional standpoint <clears throat> yeah uh, you know from Minnesota uh, and, and Southern Illinois and Illinois State, the fact that we were coming off performances that we didn't feel like were quite as good. And, but as a coaching staff, we tried to stay on message. We tried to stay uh, pretty even keel and just make sure that we're getting better every week. We can't get too low on those weeks, but we also can't get too high in the fact that we beat uh, a conference opponent in Austin P. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, we were expected to win that game, and we should be. Uh, and so now we go play uh, Ohio on the road, and, uh, you know, we'll be an underdog in that game, but that doesn't mean that uh, we can't go down there and win. Now, you talk about Ohio. We'll, we'll talk briefly about them. They suffered an injury at quarterback the other day. They were kind of doing like you guys had done the first couple games, two quarterbacks. Each had a little bit different strength. One, The one that got hurt was kind of penciled in as the, the starter. As a defensive now – minded coach does that help you a little bit that you're only focusing really now on one guy for Ohio and I guess do you have enough tape on the other guy to be able to kind of get a true evaluation well they they had played both quarterbacks early in the season much like like you said like we did and uh you know I was listening to coach Solich talk about it and he feels like it was an advantage for their football team that not that they you know wanted to focus on just one guy but now that they have to, they have at least one guy that has some experience. And so we've seen enough tape that we, we kind of have an idea what, what uh, uh, Sprague can do uh, as far as at the quarterback position. He wasn't the starter, uh, and the guy that they were starting was a little more athletic, uh, but um, he has done some good things. And he came in and he finished their, their game last week against Idaho with a win and was able to put up some pretty good numbers. So... Uh, they're going to have a good, you know, good players there, uh, much like at tailback. They, they, the guy that they list as their third teamer is, is really their leading rusher now. So uh, they're going to have good players, and, and um, they're very well coached, and we know that going in. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, they were able to get a lot of turnovers against Idaho, and that kind of helped mm -hmm. them. It looked like get a, a short field. The one player who stood out to me was their linebacker. He had 14 tackles and three interceptions. I'm guessing as an, as, as an off on the offensive side of the ball, mm -hmm. that's a guy that they've kind of circled that mm -hmm. we need to know where he's at on the field this week. Well, yeah, and, you know, anytime you have three interceptions in a game, you've put in a day and then, you know, four, tack 14, that's one of the best days I've ever heard of, you know, for a linebacker. But – <clears throat> uh, they have good players around the board. And what they do defensively, uh, they're not real complicated. Uh, they're going to basically play what they play up front, and, and they're going to lock you down on the outside with their two press corners. And they've got those uh, safeties sitting back there that are that really it's almost a nine-man front, the way they trigger versus the run. And, <clears throat> and so um, we know going in what we're going to see. Uh, we just have to go in and execute and be physical because they're going to be.
Now, Coach, good luck over there this weekend. The game will be at 1 o'clock Central Time, 2 o'clock over there in Athens, Ohio. It's a little bit farther drive, so I encourage people to go, but it's a little bit farther than you, than you think it is. It's over almost all the way to West Virginia if you want to pull out a map and kind of kind of see where that is. But if you can listen, if you can't make it over there, listen to it on the Panther Football Radio Network. Coach, good luck over there this week, and we'll talk to you next week wrapping up the Ohio game. Be right back with this week in EIU Athletics. Panther fans, here's what's going on in Panther Athletics. Panther football picks up win number one on the season, defeating Austin P 63-7 in their OVC opener. Volleyball now 6-7 on the season as they went 1-3 at the Penn State Tourney. The Panthers' lone win came against DePaul. Women's soccer picked up their first win of the season this past week, defeating Chicago State on the road 2-0. The win came after a 3-1 loss to Valparaiso at Lakeside Field. The Panthers are now 1-7-1 on the season. Men's soccer drops to 2-5 on the year as they lost a pair of non-conference matches at Bowling Green and Cincinnati. Women's rugby dropped their second match of the season at Lindenwood last week, 24-13. Women's golf placed 7th at the Southern Illinois Tournament, with Tiffany Wolf leading the way for the Panthers in 17th place individually. Men's golf wrapped up play at the Chicago State Tourney on Tuesday. For results of that tournament for EIU, check out EIUPanthers.com. And softball hosted fall games at Williams Field this past weekend against Parkland College and Alney Central College. Now, here's what to watch for this week. On Friday, women's soccer opens up OBC play at Lakeside Field against Southeast Missouri State at 3 p.m. Volleyball also opens their OBC schedule as they are in Cookville, Tennessee to take on Tennessee Tech at 7 p.m. On Saturday, softball continues fall play at Williams Field. They'll play Illinois Central College at 12 noon, and then at 4 p.m. they will hit the field against Wabash College. Panther football steps back out of the conference as they take on Ohio at 1 p.m. You can listen to the game on HitMix 88.9 WEIU, or you can watch it on ESPN3. Volleyball with another OVC road match as they're at Jacksonville State at 3 p.m. Women's rugby with their home opener at Lakeside Field against Tennessee at 3 o'clock. And men's soccer begins Summit League action as they are at Nebraska-Omaha for a 7 p.m. night match. On Sunday, softball continues fall matches as they host Lakeland College at Williams Field for a doubleheader starting at 11 in the morning. Women's soccer heads over to Edwardsville for an OVC battle against the Cougars of SIUE at 1 p.m. And next Wednesday, October 1st, volleyball with their home opener at Lance Arena as they square off against OVC rival SIUE at 6 p.m. Reporting for Panther Sports Talk, I'm Brad Kupiak. Welcome back to Panther Sports Talk. We're now joined by Dan Verdon. And I'm going to say Verdon because Dave Kidwell all the time, I, for the longest time I called you Verdun. And every time Dave Kidwell corrected me, and you've known Dan a lot of time, so I don't, I don't take that wrong from Dave. But the reason we're here talking to you, Dan, is you just came out with a book on Eastern Illinois football history. And I know Dave was a big part of that in terms of helping you dig up a lot of the, I guess, the nuggets about EIU football. Dave was a big help. So were you, Rich. Uh, Sandy King, lots and lots of people. Uh... The book, uh, as you mentioned, tells the whole history of Eastern football going all the way back to 1899. And I think there's a little something for everybody in there. Now, you, you've kind of, when you do one of these books, you go through, and people know the modern history. I think a lot of times I'm kind of a history buff guy, and you may be as well since you're writing these books. I guess what are some of the things that you learned about EIU football that even as an alumnus of the program, you, you maybe weren't aware of? Well, it's interesting. Most people think, you know, Eastern's been one of the powers, you know, in FCS and back in Division II days. But when I talked to Jim Edgar, who, you know, grew up in here in Charleston, he said, you know, they were just awful. And I think from 1951 up until the national championship season of 78, I think they had three winning seasons. And I think the last one prior to 78 was like 1961. So that was kind of a shocker for, I think, myself and a lot of other people. Now, the rags to riches story, most people are familiar with. They're the 1977 team, 1-10, come back 1978. They always talk about the fact that the program might have been dropped, that they weren't successful, and Daryl Mudra comes in. Did you were able to talk to, I'm assuming you talked to a few guys from that team, maybe even Coach Mudra. What, what did they tell you? What was kind of the mindset as to what helped turn the program that year? I did talk to quite a few players. Uh, I talked to John Tierlink, who was an assistant coach, and, of course, Coach Mudra. And nearly all of them said from day one, Mudra came in and said, we're going to win a national championship. And uh, the, co the assistant coaches, Mike Shanahan and John Tierlink, really set the tone and got the players to believe. And it was basically the same players that had been through that one win season. Now, you also, before that, the, you talked about Eastern's history hadn't been great. They had been to one bowl game. They went to the Corn Bowl, which used to be played up in Bloomington Normal, Decatur area. And I'm assuming you talked to some guys from that because that would have been the one bright spot before 78. I did. I was able to talk to Lou Stivers, who actually still lives here in Charleston, uh, Lou was, uh, of course, they played both ways back then. He was the center and also played linebacker and he was team captain. And, uh, you know, he's sharp as attack. He's uh, in his 80s now. 
Uh, there was a reunion a few years ago for some of those fellows. Uh, as he mentioned, you know, a lot of them are passing on. So it was a great opportunity to talk to Lou. Now, one of the other people that's in the book, he wrote a forward for you is Bob Spoo, a longtime coach here. You guys um, had a book signing a couple weeks ago at, at the first game against SIU. He was one of the people that came out and signed the book for you. I'm sure he had, I wouldn't say nuggets for him, but he probably had a lot of information, but he's probably the hardest guy in the world to get you to share information. He is. <laughs> You know, and, and what you do in those situations, I'm sure you're well aware of Rich, is if Coach Spoon won't talk about himself, you go out and you talk to people about him. So I talk to former players. I talk to people from administration. Um, I talk to a lot of opposing coaches. And to a man, they all said, you know, one of the most honest people they'd ever met. Um, I heard some really good stories from some people who recruited against him and said, you know, he was always above board. Now, the other thing, and kind of because books take longer than I think people would realize to put together, you actually were able to come to a high point. I know we had originally kind of started doing this. It was Coach Spoo's last year, which wasn't a, a great year. There was a lot of, there were some highlights, but not a lot. But you came in and were able to get Dino Babers two years. And I know Jimmy Garoppolo and Eric Lohr are in the book as well. And even I looked at it the other day, Kim Dameron got one page in there because right. of the press date actually worked out. But it had to be exciting when you're trying to, to put a book out to be able to kind of book in that with a highlight season like last year. It was it was so exciting, and it kept pushing things back, as you said, but I, I'll push it back any time for a reason like that. I mean, last year was arguably one of the greatest seasons in Eastern history. And the way the book ends is I took a computer simulation of all the great teams in Eastern history and played them out in a, a tournament, and you have, to, you have to get the book to find out who won. Now, you were able to talk to some of those people we talked about. You talked to Jimmy Garoppolo. You talked to Sean Payton. Those are charismatic guys, and so they, they probably have some information in that book that people aren't even aware of and maybe shared some things with you that maybe the general public doesn't know about some rituals or some funny things that happened in EIU football. Yeah, there were some interesting things. Like, um, for example, Garoppolo came here. He was number 15. He had been number 10 all his life, you know, from the time of a little kid. So going into his junior year, the opportunity came open for him to get number 10 back, and that was one of the things he wanted to do. Uh, Sean, of course, played here when I was a student here, when I worked for the Eastern News. Uh, so it was interesting to catch up with him. I appreciate it, Dan. He'll be back at homecoming, and he'll be signing more copies of the book along with Coach Boone. I think Tim Carver is also going to okay. be here that weekend as well. So more information is available at the EIU bookstore. Ryan Hastings. Ryan is the Assistant Athletic Director for Development for EIU Athletics. And Ryan, first of all, for folks that aren't familiar with the title, what does that mean? Well, Mike, I uh, am in charge here at EIU of everything on the external side of things as far as fundraising, um, and that includes gifts from $10,000 and below, um, our annual fund drive, and then we have also, you know, in our staff, John Smith, who handles all of the major gifts and works with those folks. And then the, uh, the areas of special events and also uh, corporate sponsorships are some things that I oversee. Development fundraising is more important than ever in current economic times in athletics. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, we're in an environment where state funding is lower than maybe it's ever been, um, and so the support of Panther Club members, people in the community, and alumni is uh, more important than it has ever been for us as a department and as a university as a whole. Really, the athletic department needs to be more self-sufficient than it ever has been. Well, there's no doubt about that. You know, we've got to find a way to continue to grow our uh, just our base of donors, people who give to us on an annual basis, as well as our corporate sponsorships. And then we also need to find a way to uh, continue to engage the communities where we're at, you know, and that includes Charleston, includes Mattoon, includes um, the Effingham area here locally, and then also all of our um, alumni in the Chicagoland area here close, um, and then anybody who's associated with the university, a friend of the university. We've got a uh, new athletic director, Tom Michaels, been on the job a little over a month now. At an engagement in the community is a, a big focus for him, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Tom um, has made it a, a very you know, important goal for our entire staff to get out and be visible. Um, you know, here next Friday, we're going to host the Coles County Clash, and I think that's a great opportunity for us as a university and as an athletic department to show that, that we're invested um, for Charleston and for Mattoon, and we work alongside those administrations to make that a great event. And then we, you know, in return, we're hoping that, that everybody will buy into us even more than they, than they have up to this point. Now, as far as specific projects go, I know one that's on the boards right now is uh, for men's basketball, uh, upgrades to their locker room, and you'd still like to raise some money, right, to finish that project off? Yeah, absolutely. It's a uh, project where we've, uh, we've worked on for a little over a year at this point, um, and people have been very generous up, up till now, but we're looking to try to, to really enhance and, and do whatever we can to help Jay um, get his program to where he wants it to be and where we all think he's going to take it. And he, uh, he's made steps here in the first two years, and I think they're going to have a great year here this year. Um, but if we could really get this project going, um, 
I think it would really help him as far as recruiting, as far as you know, enhancing his current roster and, and really making his program stand out among other ones in the OVC. Are there specific things beyond that that uh, you're working on, or, or is it more general in nature right now? Well, you know, our focus right now, we're, we're always looking for people who want to find ways to partner with us. Um, and one way that people, if they're really looking to make a difference for the department, could get involved is to join the Panther Club. Um, and we have varying levels. You can find it on our website. And uh, we would love for people to, uh, to, to contact me, contact anybody in our office, in our department, to try to, to help us out. And then we're also looking for for businesses that want to partner with us, you know, whether that's through in-kind donations or through sponsorships, and anybody who's interested in that, be be happy to talk to them as well. Panther Club has its annual fund drive in the spring, so that's been a few months ago that that wrapped up, but very successful in 2014, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. You know, we're always surpri we're never, never surprised by it, but we're always amazed by the the generosity of our. Panther Club members, the community as a whole, and we have a great group of volunteers with the Panther Club who really help us because, you know, currently we have about, you know, two full-time staff members who work in development, um, and when you're trying to, to engage an alumni base and in a community that's as big as ours, you, you need more than that, and so the community involvement is key and it, it's crucial for us. Love to talk to people about how we can partner with you to, to make EIU everything that we all want it to be, um, and I think, you know, we, we've, we're positioned to do great things. Uh, we're all excited here as a staff. Um, and also I know our coaches are to work with Tom um, to make EIU what he wants it to be as he continues to implement his vision and, and what he, his stamp he wants to put on the program. It is the Ohio Valley Conference opener, the Eastern Illinois Panthers, ready to host the Governors of Austin P. Second down 10, handoff left side, Roberson hit behind the line, going to be pulled down for a loss on the play. Whitlow back, four-man rush, good time, going to the right sideline, Powell's open, got it, first down, he's at the 40, broken tackle, 35-30, taken down at the Austin P. 30-yard line. Whitlow back to pass, steps up, he's got room to motor, he's at the 25, Whitlow at the 20, cuts back at the 15, fights forward at the 11, he's a little short to the first down, but big pickup for him on the scramble. Yeah, he gained about 13 yards on that, and that's what he can do. Uh, he can take off and run. Out of the shotgun, Whitlow looks to run to his left side, dodge one man at the 10, cuts back at the 5, and goes over. Touchdown, Eastern Illinois. The second touchdown this year for senior quarter, or rather junior quarterback, Jalen Whitlow. That looked like a pretty much a designed run to me as Whitlow took it off around the left side and uh, made a nice cut. And then just kind of dove for the end zone and went in heads over heels. Three-man rush, he steps up to keep it and is going to be hit and stopped short of the first down. Fedney Delphons came up. Fedney didn't rush the quarterback, kind of laid back a little bit. And then the defensive end came over and tackled Boone short of the first down. Whitlow back to pass. A lot of time now. He rolls out to his right at the 20. Whitlow at the 25. A little cut back 30. 35, 36. Got the first down. That's the strength Jalen Whitlow brings to the package. Zach Stewart on the tackle. Making a very nice cut back to the inside, picking up the necessary yardage for the first down. Whitlow back, planned run around the right ends, got the first down, cuts back 50, 45, and he nearly broke that. The last guy that could stop him, Antonio Turner, brought him down at the Austin P44. Second and 12, hand to Roberson, taken down near the line. Laquise Taylor was there to wrap him up right after he took the handoff. He'll get through the middle, Duncan. No, Whitlow kept around right in. A lot of room, 40, 35, 30. Whitlow down the sideline, 20, 15, upended at the 14-yard line. A lot of time, throws it right flat, hits Duncan at the five, get the first down, goes for the goal line. Touchdown, Eastern Illinois, on a great stretch by Duncan as he reached the right hand and the football out over the goal line when he was going down. Well, just exceptional individual effort that time by Taylor Duncan as they swung him out of the backfield. He was open to receive the pass, and he picked up the first down but he wasn't satisfied with that he made a nice uh, leap over a couple of defenders fakes a handoff end around to keandre gober coming around the left end a lot of room he's at the 40 gober at the 50 blocker in front 40 30 and tiptoes out of bounds around the 25 yard line Whitlow again, empty backfield, he'll run again. Up the middle at the five, pushing behind Seibert, and he goes over. Touchdown, Eastern Illinois, as Colin Seibert led the way into the end zone, and Whitlow just got behind him and followed him in. Nice patient run by Whitlow that time, as he took care of the last three uh, running plays himself. Fake handoff, Whitlow back, a lot of time, steps up, getting it deep, down the hash mark right for Drake, he's got it at the 25. Nice throw, Drake had about a half a step on the defender, Montez Carlton, and Whitlow put it right in his hand. 
Second down and six at the seven. And a handoff to Lira, heading right, finds a hold at the five. He's got an easy walk-in touchdown. Jimmy Lira scores. First down, 10 to go. Handoff to Lira with blockers in front around the left end. Finds a hole 50, 45, 40. Still going 35, tripped up and tackled at the 33. Panthers have it at the Austin P. 13, first and 10. Whitlow, handoff to Lira, left sweep at the 15, at the 10, at the five. It's a touchdown for Jimmy Lira and Eastern Illinois. Great blocking by the Panther offensive line. And when Lira turned the corner, there was nobody there. There's the snap to Campbell. Panthers with a rush, and they block it. Inside the 10, inside the 5, and it's a touchdown for Eastern Illinois. Antoine Johnson blocked the kick and recovered it himself for the touchdown. Production for Panther Sports Talk is brought to you in part by the following supporters of WEIU.